Hello, turtle people. It's your boy Dre, and I'm here with my turtle Steve. Cowabunga! What happened to motherfuckers? Do we don't say cowabunga motherfuckers? Not for the children. No, <laughs> no children are allowed to listen to Fine Time. Unless their parents are very, very cool. <laughs> no, I guess not. Would your would your would your parents allow you to listen to Fine Time? Uh officially no, unofficially my dad wouldn't care. <laughs> <laughs> um all right. As the name implies, yes, I still say that. We're here to talk about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles over the last year or so of basically this resurgence, Steve, which I didn't really notice as it was happening last year with the collection of Shredder's Revenge, but now with the movie, I'm like, oh man, we are in a new Turtles era. Yeah, um, I, I, we kind of just alluded to it a second ago, but uh, Nickelodeon's the current rights holders, and I guess they're remembering the old adage of remember who pays for this shit. And I can only assume that means, you know, other fogies our age are starting to, you know, really look at this shit. You know, they got a Andrew and a Sven, you know, and Sven's there like, we must sell the turtles. <laughs> what the hell is going on? I don't <laughs> Who know. the fuck are Andrew and Sven? <laughs> they're, they're, they're us trying to, trying to sell Ninja Turtles to, you know, everybody, to, to, to the people that left a while ago, Andre. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. I, I don't know because because they they reached out to Tribute Games after the Dragon's Trap remake a few years ago to work on something. Remember the Dragon's Trap remake? How we all loved that shit. It was great, or at least how I loved that shit. No, it was really good. And they said, "Well, fuck yeah, well, we well, we want to work on Ninja Turtles." And then apparently they learned that Dot EMU was also already made a successful pitch to work on a Ninja Turtle project, and they decided, "Let's just." work on it together instead of having two separate so-so products and thank god they fucking did i mean i it's it, i didn't find anything quite so concrete for cowabunga collection but i'm only assuming that if they're already being so insider gamer by visiting people like tribute <laughs> they're they're already looking into look konami made all these games a long time ago <laughs> Let's just make all this shit happen again, because I am sure they were not jazzed with whatever the hell that Platinum game was a while ago. You mean the game that got delisted in like nine months? Didn't it get delisted within like a year? It was something really fast like that. Yeah, it was weird because like that's when Platinum was doing all the licensed stuff. They did that Korra game. They did the Transformers game. I don't know if you remember that. I remember Korra, and now that you, I, they did Transformers, really? Yeah, trans. I don't even remember what it was called, but it was definitely like you had witch time and everything. You had like Transformer <laughs> witch <laughs> Transformers. Yeah, you did. It was like they didn't care, man. Look, it was a pretty good game because Platinum. I mean, of course, right? But it was just like I can't believe they fucked up the turtles. This is also, you know. I think around this time they made like Star Fox Zero. I think they were like spreading themselves pretty thin. I don't know. Star Fox Zero, I, I maintain, was just Miyamoto in the corner and like, look, you need to save the Wii U, okay? So you go sit over there and save the Wii U while everyone else was, you know, actually making the switch. <laughs> <laughs> they were going to give you platinum to help you out. No, don't leave us alone with them. It's for the greater good, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I just they they needed money, I guess. I don't know why. Maybe Bayonetta 2 didn't rake it in like they thought. I, I don't know. But all of a sudden, it's like we need to do a bunch of licensed stuff. Anyway, one of these days we'll have to like when we have computers powerful enough to emulate that sort of thing, we'll have to explore that Platinum Turtles game because it's got to be a riot. 
Oh, it's got to be something. <laughs> I mean, it was really cheap by the time it was about to be dis- delisted, but I just never, I never bit. Um, anyway, you want to talk about just because we're different ages here, we caught different eras of turtles. So, you know, what I might think of may not be the stuff you think of and vice versa. Also, it's just fun to share that kind of stuff because like anyone my age, for anyone who doesn't know, I'm 41 years old. So I caught the first wave of turtles. Like it came along at the perfect time. I was like seven, eight, nine years old when that shit was really rolling. And what what kid that age would not be into turtles? Like, come on. It was perfect. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I was never really into action figures as a kid. I only liked the turtles. Like my friends had G.I. Joe's and shit like that, Steve, and I just never cared. In fact, we used the G.I. Joe's for like makeshift foot soldiers when we played Turtles. <laughs> By the time I was uh, coming of age, the hot action figure were the Power Rangers, and those were hot because they had the Megazords and th- they fit into each other. So th- that was the hot shit for a time. But Ninja Turtles kept going even after. Uh, <laughs> The series like ended and it was in syndication for years and years. Like, but they were getting stupider by the time I was becoming of age. Like, you couldn't just get turtles. Like, you had like the Ninja Turtles sports team pack. Like, where oh, everyone man. was like, it was like <laughs> you had like Donatello's got a baseball bat and Mikey's got so- <laughs> and Mikey's ready to play croquet for some reason. Who's ready for some shuttlecock? I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> even, even even back then, I'm like, what 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 are you what are you guys really doing? <laughs> yeah, you know, I forgot about the themed turtles like that, actually. you you kind of brought that memory roaring back. Yeah, that was I, I weird. Guess- I, I guess when Playmates is the only game in town, yeah, I, I guess you get to do whatever you want, but at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what were you all doing? <laughs> oh, man. I don't know. Like, for me, though, Turtles was the first thing in my life that was, like, truly a phenomenon that everybody was so into, like, especially when the video game started hitting. And then that sort of culminated in that first movie in 1990 when that hit. Oh, my God. That was the first time I remember I saw a movie right when it came out. The next Monday on the school bus, everybody was talking about it. Everybody had seen it. You know, we were talking about our favorite. Oh, and they put Shredder in the trash compactor. And, you know, when he kicked it, I mean, just everything, man. Sorry for anyone who hasn't seen the original movie. I spoiled the whole movie. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you movie critic types go, well, actually, none of the Ninja Turtle movies are really good. Well, well fuck you. The first, first two are just really, <laughs> the, the first two are really fun to watch because, you know, that's allowed sometimes. Sometimes. Things can just be fun to watch, you know, unlike three, which was a goddamn. You know, I remember renting three. We didn't go to the theater to see that one. I remember renting three and being really bored. I remember like not paying attention halfway through. I remember there was a part where they're in the Wild West and they're riding on horses. And I was like, I am I'm mentally checked out. I didn't see them in the movie, so I because, you know, I'm younger than you. (laughs) Oh, wow. So there'd be a lot of Ninja Turtle tapes being rented, including the first two movies. I'm like, yeah, that, those were good. And then three, we'd borrow. I'd borrow once too. I'm like, uh, oh my god, this this there'd be there was like 10, 15 minutes of them like in of a really bad samurai movie. I'd come to appreciate it now, just as as a genre. But like, they, this is. This isn't Ninja Turtles. Where, where, where are the Ninja Turtles? What the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah, we were fucking. I mean, like, like I said, I was just so bored. Even as like a rental, I was just like, oh man, I don't want to. Can I just put back on the the Super Nintendo? I don't. I really don't want to watch this. But the cartoon was like appointment viewing. I don't know when it aired in your area. Well, I guess you wouldn't. Well, I don't know. I guess it still did air by the time you were of age, right? Well, again, it was the the initial run was done, but it was very much in syndication in the morning. Like if I got up in time before school, I can catch a stray episode here and again. And I very much did. You know, what was weird when I was a kid. I remember when Power Rangers started, I would say like what, 93 ish. And I remember that was like a thing. It's like move over Ninja Turtles. Now it's the Power Rangers. Like it was like a passing of the baton of like fads, I guess, or something. 
it was weird how they painted. I remember seeing that. I don't know. There were a lot of things that insisted the turtles were done for, like Battletoads and uh, (laughs) the Cowboys and Moo Mesa. And, you know, that was like they were in the same family and they're like, move over, turtles. (laughs) (laughs) One, I like that. This is not the first time this year we have mentioned Cowboys of Moo Mesa on Fine Time. Number two, um, I watched Cowboys of Moo Mesa a lot and I liked it. It was that was the only one of the turtle likes that I liked. I didn't like Street Sharks or any of the other ones. I liked Cowboys of Moo Mesa. Biker Mice from Mars. You ever see that? Yeah, th- I did see that. It was all right. It was OK. I like the character designs, but I didn't really watch it too much. So I would be remiss, Steve, if I didn't mention that I caught the Ninja Turtles concert that went around the country in 1990. I I, I mean, I, I know you're a little too young to remember this. Surely you know about this in retrospect. I, I believe you because I went to uh, when it was in its prime, I went to a uh, Power Rangers Live, wherein we went to a stage show at Radio City Music Hall, and we had to beat the pretend villain of the day with 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 the flashing ticket holograms. We, we were <laughs> we were all helping. That kind of sounds badass, actually. I probably would have loved that if I were a kid. I wasn't even into Power Rangers when we were when we were when we were eight or nine or when however old I was. Yeah, it was pretty neat. <laughs> yeah, so like in this, um, there wasn't really. Well, I think there was some audience participation, you know, like you had to, oh, now everyone screams. So Shredder gets scared or something like that, you know, like <laughs> shit like that. You know, like, it was really funny. Um, oh, God, there was a part where um, Shredder was putting stuff in a literal shredder and like glitter would spew <laughs> into the audience. He's like, here's the new new kids on the block album shred. And he throw it in. <laughs> <and> like, <laughs> it was so it was great. Anyway, (laughs) this thing came to the San Diego Sports Arena in like late 1990. And I remember going, my mom took me and she bought me foam nunchucks. They had all the weapons there. I wanted the nunchucks. Donatello was my favorite, but I wanted the nunchucks. That was the coolest weapon. Of course you did. Yeah. And during the intermissions, there was two intermissions because children, all the kids would get on the floor there at the sports arena in front of the stage and fight with those weapons that all the parents bought them. (laughs) There was just some there was just like hundreds of kids on the floor just beating the shit out of each other with these weapons. And I didn't go down there, not because my mom wouldn't let me. She's like, we were just looking because we were in the upper bowl because that's what we get afford. Right? right. And then so we were looking down there. It's like, oh, man, that is a you know, I didn't I didn't really have any desire to go down there and beat any kids with my foam nunchucks. So I think she probably would have let me, but I just, I didn't feel like it anyway. It was a fun little concert. There was a, I remember Michael Angelo sang some sort of ballad about following your heart. And then that's how they found Krang and shredder or something. I don't know. It was so goofy. <laughs> it was, it was really stupid, but it was great for an eight year old. It was excellent, Steve. So um, I will, I will always remember that. Um, so, yeah, that's the kind of Turtles fan I was. The merch was out of control, as we mentioned. I mean, I oh, I don't know the genre of this, but maybe you can tell me. They used to sell cassette tapes with a comic book or a like a regular book. And you'd listen to the tape and you'd read the book or the comic along. And it was almost like a radio show play with like sound effects and everything. And you'd like read along. You understand they, what I mean? It, like, does that they, they read the book to you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had the dialogue. I, I never seen one for Ninja Turtles, but I've seen it for a whole lot of other things. And I'm going to just take a wild guess and assume uh, every one of those start with the turtles started with what do you hear? Cowabunga! Turn the page. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. I, 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 I never saw one for turtles or even a comic book, but there were lots and lots of kids books and things when i was of that age where it'd be some kind of chime or other prompt to like turn the page yeah but that (laughs) you dumb shit kid (laughs) that wasn't the only turtles thing i had read along i did have turtles books with the tape so they probably did have something like that cowabunga anyway uh this sort of reminiscing is a perfect lead-in to the cowabunga collection that came out last year on pretty much everything 
And all the Konami Turtles games of old are here. All the versions, arcade, NES, Super Nintendo, everything is here. Even even Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, the arcade game, which should be sued for false advertising. But I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, it's a bit of cheating for me because even when I'd be too old for Turtles, I'd, I'd be very fond when I found uh, the NES carts and, and the cheap bow bins at a uh, Goodwill back in the early 2000s or what have you so so that'd be my continued connection with the turtles over the years but uh I, i'm glad that they're all in one very convenient set now especially three on game boy which is way too fucking much money on ebay <laughs> yeah that's i mean i don't know about these prices of of real games quote unquote since i don't buy them but yeah i've i've heard um can we talk about I just wanted to cherry pick a few things from the collection. Obviously, we're not going to go over the whole thing here, but um, just a few things. One thing I want to talk about is that I think the original NES game is a complete conundrum. There's some people who think it's really good. A lot of people think it's bad. I don't I think you're not a fan of it, right? I tried it again here and I just can't get into it. It's a real big conundrum because even at the time I felt that way. I think both of us can agree, though, that opening song and that intro is like an all timer. That is an all fucking timer. Konami throw their dick down on the table like, no, we have the Ninja Turtles theme, like the most iconic theme in TV right now. Fuck that. We're going to throw that away and make this original song that's going to knock you on the floor and they did it that shit is incredible the rest of the tunes aren't so bad either i mean if oh no it's classic konami stuff it's it's really good i mean going back to the uh castlevania on game boy conversation if i could just listen to those without playing the game <laughs> <laughs> well in this collection you can very much do that digitally clip saw it so you can pop in that fake cassette tape and uh listen all you want And yes, I know you make fun of me for this all the time, but yes, I did notice this at the time. This original Ninja Turtles game for NES is indeed 30 frames a second, something that didn't happen back then. That's why it was so noticeable. I was like, why is this game move so jank? That's why. You know, it's weird. The first time I played, like really, really played it was uh, when I got the cart secondhand. The only other time was when I played it on uh, Play Choice 10, right? That was the arcade NES. Yeah. Like, that was my only other time playing that before I got it secondhand. And I'm just remembering everything jittering around all the time, like flashing in and out out of existence as NES artifacting does. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is this isn't great. (laughs) Yeah. So imagine if it actually did run at full speed, it'd probably be permanent slow down the whole time anyway. So it's like, I guess try to have it and salvage it. They had to just get the game out. It didn't matter. Yeah. I, anyway, I say this game is a conundrum because there's stuff about it. That's great. And there's stuff about it. That's awful. And it becomes this mix that to this day, I still cannot decide whether this game is good or not. Of course, Andre will say, well, if you play the uh, underwater section perfectly, it's actually a big plus in the game's favor. (laughs) It's not that hard, everybody. It's not. (laughs) Just do it. Just do it frame perfect like I did on the PlayStation 5 version that I bought specifically so I can make this video and show off on the Internet. (laughs) Yeah. And you saw how much damage I took in that video. And you know what I did? I switched to another turtle and then I beat the level. It's very easy, everybody. You have four turtles. <laughs> it's just so, it's that simple. <laughs> it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. Andre's right. We all huffed a lot of copium in the 80s and later on. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle 2, the arcade game, uh, not not that great in retrospect. It, it, it's not. Never was. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, The Manhattan Project. It's great. Did you give this one a chance or uh, this one still slip you by? Uh, I, I did play it. It's fine. It's fine. It doesn't offend me like Ninja Turtles 2, the arcade game. It, it's fine, for it's, especially for the system. And, you know, I don't usually like to add caveats like that. It's fine. 
I, I, again, that one, I didn't play at all until, again, I found it secondhand. I'm like, they, they put a third one on here? I'm, because when I was younger, everyone had the second game. Everyone. And we're like, this, this is pretty good. Okay, the Pizza Hut signs fall down on, on the turtles because even though we're in New York, there's there's pe- there's metal Pizza Hut signs <laughs> that, that, that fall on turtles. <laughs> You're, this you're is act, fine. You're acting like no one eats Pizza Hut in New York, and I know you're about to tell me no one does, and you know it's not true. So don't say that to me. Okay, but we didn't have metal signs that fell on turtles. To- <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I kind of. I was there, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, can we talk about how good that first Game Boy game is, though? What is it called? Rise of the Foot Clan. That was surprisingly gr- kind of great. I didn't have that. These were all new to me. And I was pleasantly surprised with, I, I didn't know how, what to expect. And I was just pleasantly surprised with just the game in general. Like it's fairly simple. You just go right and bop foot ninjas and the occasional uh, robot. But after that, it's uh, yeah, and you fight a boss at the end. But it, if I had the game, I would have played it again and again as a youngin, a la Kirby's Dreamland and everything else I had as a kid. But I don't know. Two? <laughs> I don't I, I don't think two is that bad. It's not as good as the first one, but it's not it's not as bad. You got a chance to play that third one that you mentioned is really rare though. What did you what did you think of that? Does it does well of course it doesn't deserve its scarcity, but what did you think? Nothing deserves its scarcity, but uh I thought it was a lot of fun. You get earlier version of a Search action y genre that we call something else, but not really. No, no. But it, it, it's fairly linear, but I, I, I could see why it feels that way. The Digital Eclipse version has like a better map that you can look at. <laughs> That's one great thing about this collection. They tell you how to cheat. All the hints are like telling you like exactly how to cheese the game, basically, especially in the in the original Turtles game for NES. Oh, just stand up on this ledge and like use Donatello and stab him or whatever. They just literally tell you to do that, which is really good. (laughs) You do kind of have to cheat towards the end, though, because they give you spoiler alert. They give you a boss rush towards the end and they kind of expect you to do it all at one shot. I'm like, "Uh, you know what? I'm in my mid thirties. I don't have anything to prove. We'll just save in between each one, <laughs> <laughs> especially since they, they all hit like a dump truck, but, but it's actually a lot of fun. And what I really took away from it the most is that it's a single player experience that makes you play as all four of the turtles and they all do different stuff. It's not like the original NES game where like, Raphael, Michelangelo are fucking useless. And then it's like <laughs> Raph is basically for the swimming level because I don't really know what else I'd use him for. No, you ha- you have to radically rescue the other three turtles and use <laughs> all of them to do different things. <laughs> when you rescue them, is there a dialogue that pops up and says, wow, Michelangelo, that was a radical rescue. It might as well have said that <laughs> for all of them, because holy shit. <laughs> And then you get to the end and Splinter says, wow, that was a really radical rescue. <laughs> <laughs> Let's oh, get a man. pizza. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> From Pizza Hut trademark symbol. <laughs> um, I OK, I had never played the Hyperstone Heist, the Genesis game. I actually didn't really know anything about it. So much to my surprise, it was just a Frankensteining of Turtles in Time. A very bizarre Frankensteining, just reusing all the assets and music and just putting him in a blender, Steve. Just really weird. You know what I know about knew about Hyperstone Heist before finally playing it? I knew that this was also a fairly expensive game and that a lot of Genesis owners like to suck its dick. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. Maybe if you only had a Genesis, I can understand. But like, <laughs> but but when I'm logging in and you're pl- and the f- first thing we're jumping into is like the saddest sounding first level arcade theme, and you're in the sewer. I'm like, this is this is depressing and it's lazy and it's hurting my ear holes. Well, well it just says New York City, but then they throw you right in the sewer. Like it's weird. I mean, I guess I I mean, yeah, I get that the turtles live in the sewer, but like, 
And the levels are so fucking long. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, because they jammed all, like I said, they literally, it's like five levels that they used all the assets from Turtles in Time from. And they just jammed all together in like huge levels. I was actually okay with it. I was like, okay, look, if you only had a Genesis and this is your only option, like it's fine. But that went out the window once you get to the boss rush that is literally called the gauntlet. They ran out of ideas halfway through their Frankensteining adventure. Like, that's so unforgivably lazy. That's what makes this game a piece of crap. I don't know. I was already having enough by the time I got through two and a half levels. And I'm like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, but like, look, as like a Turtles in Time, like randomizer clone or whatever you want to call it, like it's serviceable enough. Like the gameplay is there, but they shouldn't, they shouldn't have done that boss rush. I was, that was the worst. Um, and as for, as for like the sad rendition of the, of the theme. Yeah. It's the Genesis. I mean, it's, <laughs> I, it's mean, sad. You, <laughs> I mean, what do you expect from this system? It's not gonna, it's not gonna hit like that. But speaking of turtles in time, this collection was a good reminder that SNES turtles in time is better than the arcade. And that's not something I say around these parts. It really is. And I was surprised to like really confirm that back to back because I played a lot of uh, the arcade version because it was a mainstay out here in a lot of places and yep. again and again. And I didn't have a Super Nintendo t- version until years later and I didn't play that one as much. But last year when I played that one and I played those like, the Super Nintendo version's better, right? I'm not imagining this. <laughs> no, it's better. It doesn't. It doesn't look or sound better. I mean, it's pretty close, right? Uh, don't get me wrong. For the SNES, this looks and sounds incredible. No, it's not the arcade unit in that regard. But gameplay wise, it's great. They added one thing that Konami beat em ups in the arcade never do, and which is why they're never that good. Yes, that includes X Men. Is that the Super Nintendo version of Turtles in Time has actual like hit stun and appropriate like weight to your actions. Whereas like in the two turtles beat them up, say the arcade, you're just swishing at air. It's like, it doesn't really feel like you're hitting anything. Nothing feels very solid. Everything feels super solid on, on SNES. And it's like, and it feels very fair. It feels like a beat them up. You can actually beat rather like something you just dump quarters into. Yeah. I guess you didn't really put that together back then. <laughs> yeah. I didn't really put it together back then either. I didn't really have the words to describe it, but yeah, I always kind of preferred playing it at home and that was the reason why. And yeah, that's a SNES game I played to death and it was a, it's still a great play today, I think. Um, But yeah, what a great collection, Cowabunga collection. I'm so glad something like this can happen. You want to talk about Shredder's Revenge real quick? I've, we've talked about it on Fine Time already, and I mean it's it, it's an incredible game. But just just recap: what do you what do you think is so great about Shredder's Revenge? Well, you talked about how uh, things have have weight in uh, Turtles in Time, and everything feels like it's got weight here. You got a whole variety of enemies and a whole bunch of playable characters, including April, Splinter, and Casey, and it feels like every single hit, whether it's you know, fairly dainty and quick or smacking them real hard with the golf club or a pole stick really feels like it matters and including dodges and things and all that you could, you could play it as smartly or as, you know, casually stupidly as you want and have a great time. That's what sticks out to me like almost immediately. (laughs) Yeah, I have to agree. And, you know, talking about the differences between, you know, original arcade beat em ups, this feels like the game we thought we were playing at the arcade back then, you know, but now it's real. It's really (laughs) in our hands, which is excellent. And like, you know, a year removed from it, a year and change. I think I appreciate Shredder's Revenge even more now. I loved it at the time. Of course I did. And because this game does fucking everything right. Every single thing is correct. It might be one of the best beat em ups I've ever played. Like no joke. It is stupendous. Um, The T Lopes music excellent i mean come on everything's great oh man who was rapping on that one song when you were when you were skating across the god it's an auto scrolling level 
Jesus Christ, every piece of music in this game is just the, the it's best. It's a great thing that music was good because I think that one auto scrolling level was like the one where I'm like, nah, I don't know, guys. <laughs> I mean, it's good for variety. No, it's not the best level, but I think the only thing I would say is that maybe there's like too too many stages like maybe we didn't need one more bebop and rock steady fight at the end of another city stage right i'm glad they went all out and the stages are short enough where it really doesn't matter the game doesn't feel too long but it's almost like a, it's like an album that's like 14 songs that eh, probably could have been 12 but it's fine the stages are the right length and it going back to uh it feels like the arcade games all the backdrops are all are all correct. It's got all the fun little details in there. Even the audio cues are very similar to the arcade ones, but but without you know smacking you over the head with it outright. Like even at the end when you beat Super Shredder, oh no, I was going to have my revenge. <laughs> 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 I did like that that they actually used the Statue of Liberty as like a boss because they always threaten that, right? That's always the eye of every, you know, Oh, the statue of Liberty is taken off with, in a, with rockets under her feet, right? They are, they're always doing some crazy shit. Now they actually made it like, you know, part of the game, something you fight, which is, you know, fun. I mean, that's just the whole uh, appeal fun. You know, games are allowed to be fun. We don't all have to be, you know, mashing buttons to watch cutscenes and hanging out on tutorial plateau all day. We can have fun, Andre. <laughs> Uh, Steve, you you will play your misery simulator, The Last of Us 2, and you will not have fun. Games aren't supposed to be fun, okay? Okay, but we're going to talk about a little bit more fun because <laughs> I played the DLC. I, Ooh, I gave my, fancy. Yeah, I paid, well, it's, it was, it's on sale, a little bit on sale, but it's eight bucks. They add Yojimbo and Karai and a whole lot of new color palettes for all the characters. And... The real meat and potatoes is a new survival mode where you fight baddies across different backdrops for crystals. And if you do good, you get fun perks like heals, buffs, and even playing as bosses like Bebop, Rocksteady, and Shredder. But die once and it's over. Unfortunately, these dimensions are very much skin deep, but they are very fun to look at. Like you get... Ancient Japan and the Mirage Dimension, which looks like a comic book. Get it? Mirage uh -huh. comics. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I dig it. I personally see myself visiting it here and again to see, you know, how much better I can do because of how damn tight the game is. And it's a satisfying loop, but it might not be everyone's preferred way to spend eight bucks. You know what it kind of sounds like to me? It kind of sounds like Sonic Mania Encore. Did you play that? It's very similar in structure. Yeah, yeah. Like, because I really I thought that was a great DLC and I thought that was a great not remixing of the game, but another fun mode to play it. And I, I just thought it was a lot of fun. So it kind of sounds like that to me. Um, but yeah, just. This game is great. Uh, I often criticize indie developers on this show for not doing retro games right, because as I always say, they know what it looks like. They know what it sounds like. They don't always remember what it's supposed to play like. They don't remember the gameplay fun factor. And Shredder's Revenge absolutely does. I think we are in a golden age of beat em up revivals be like Steve between like Ninja Saviors and like Streets of Rage 4. And now this, those, these three games are incredible. They're better than any of their predecessors. I think like it, it, it I love that indie developers figured out the beat em up. I need, I'm going to fall on the sword and admit I still haven't played Streets of Rage 4 yet. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really good. You'll, you'll enjoy it. Of course you will. I mean, it's, it's, it's great stuff. In fact, I, I don't you've played Ninja Saviors, right? Your turn of the Warriors. Oh, yeah, that was good. Yeah, real good. Excellent. Um, OK, we got to talk about this movie, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem, because I had no expectations for this. As we just discussed, I watched that third Turtles movie back in the day and it was boring and I never bothered with another piece of Turtles media since. So not that that totally scared me off. I just wasn't really interested. So like with this movie, Steve, I wasn't even going to go see it until you saw it and you said it was good. But what were your expectations then? Like you, I had no expectations because I saw one and two and like those and I saw three and I hated it. And I'd see like other ones on 
DVD or video here and again. Like, remember when you'd either not try hard enough or try too hard. Remember Michael Bay? He was like, well, they're not really turtles. They're aliens. And <sighs> oh, my God, just stick your head out of your ass and just make them fight the shredder. That's all we want. I didn't watch those Michael Bay Turtles movies, and I didn't want to. The only reason why I would is that I want to know why they're rated PG-13. Do they let Leonardo say fuck or something? Like, I, I want to know what happens there. <laughs> I, I, I saw one, and I couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> so why were they rated that? Was it, like, really violent or something? I don't or like, know. I don't know. They were so bad. It was so bad. <laughs> Did anyone say a cuss? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> but but it, I, again, I saw the trailer for Mutant Mayhem, and I'm like, this looks pretty good. It's got a pretty neat stylized look, and there's some fun banner in these ads here. And I'm like, fuck it. I'll go see this. I'll, it's a summer of movies right now. We're, we're in the summer of Barbenheimer. Why not? We'll, we'll go see all the movies. And... Then I had some hope, and then I'm glad I did. <laughs> I really enjoyed Meat and Mayhem. I want you to start, though. You're more of a animation aficionado for me, and I kind of want to start on that angle. So, I mean, you can start wherever you want, but you go ahead. I could start with that, because there's a lot of times where, you know, movies get teased with uh, different concept arts and things, with things that usually get cut so it becomes more visually appealing for, you know, the general audience, or it becomes easier to animate, or the scope of the project changed outright, or whatever. And I feel like that didn't really happen here. Everybody in this movie and everything looks like they're animating comic panels on the fly, and it just really sings during the action sequences, even when they're just, just, I'm putting it in air quotes, driving around the city doing a, a stupid chase for the the ooze or whatever you want to call it. Even the background humans are just fun to look at in cut scenes. <laughs> crowd scenes. <laughs> cut scenes. Cut crowd scenes. scenes, same thing. Um, I love the point that we've gotten to with computer animation where it can look, quote unquote, as good as 2D because I understand that like – the gold standard for a long time was Pixar, but their art style was born out of a time where you didn't have the detail that you could put into stuff now. As you notice, as like Pixar movies went along, they still kept a certain style that was reminiscent of like older computer animations because that just became their art style. And a lot of people tried to emulate that. Well, before I go on, do you agree with what I'm saying? No, you're right. And they have a hard time shaking it. It's it's a big problem for Pixar. <laughs> IMO. So Turtles and I think earlier this summer, the, the Spider-Verse movie, right? I mean, we've seen both of those. The things we can do with animation of this style now is incredible. I think like we've reached a point where it's like, oh, we don't just have to look like Finding Nemo. Or cars or something. And there's nothing wrong with those movies, in my opinion. It's just that we've we finally reached a point where we've reached the stylization that I really enjoy. And I, it's great. Time has passed and they're figuring it out. That is good. <laughs> Since in this movie, April O'Neil is a teenager, much like the Turtles, she is obviously not a newscaster yet. So the news bits you see in Times Square and shit are obviously Janine Pirro, like fake Janine Pirro on Fox News. I loved it. <laughs> it's totally her, right? Yes. <laughs> it's because, like, because if anyone's going to tell you bad news about the Turtles, it's Fox News. <laughs> yeah, it, it totally had that nasty Fox News bent to it. And of course, that was on purpose. Like, but I don't know what's going on, but <laughs> it's <laughs> clearly we need more taxes. <laughs> yeah, clearly we need more police in the streets to in case we see any more green people, right? Like, I mean, it was just very... Mm, the green people are ruining New York. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Did your showing have, like, a foreword from Seth Rogen before the movie? It did. Yeah, okay. I didn't know that he, like, 
produce the movie, basically. I just thought, you know, I knew he was the voice of Bebop or Rocksteady or whoever, but I didn't. I thought that was weird at first before I realized, oh, wait, this is like his thing. He's about that age. It, it checks out. Yeah. I, I just didn't know before I before I, I was getting it. I was getting a little scared when I saw that forward because I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was what? also kind, I was also kind of hoping Bebop would do the would do the laugh. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, the best thing, <laughs> <laughs> of course, <laughs> well, let's talk about Rock City and Bebop real quick, because like that was if there was anything I didn't really like about this movie is that they've just seemed part of the big mutant crowd. They weren't like very special. They were just kind of there. And to us, I think Rock City and Bebop are like the tip top villains of the week, right? They're they're pretty important to us in this movie. They're not that important. And I was like, kind of like, eh, they're such good designs. It feels kind of wasteful to not highlight them. Although they did do that one thing where they panned across Bebop's tits and then like <laughs> his 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 nipple ring went bling right in the camera. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to I'm going to fight you a little bit on this because hearkening back to TMNT three Game Boy, it highlights what I like about this uh, franchise as a whole. It's that they're supposed to be a team or, you know, since they're just starting out here, they're brothers. They got the shared dream. They don't always agree on how to get there. They all want to do the right thing. It's corny, but, you know, there's genuine concerns about, you know, hopes, dreams and not wanting to get milked. And I feel, <laughs> I, I, I'm so, I, I laughed at that more times and more and louder than I should have every it time. It was funny. It was really funny. <laughs> How do you milk a turtle? I don't want to know. <laughs> and then that actually, yeah, it comes to fruition. <laughs> but, but I just feel like the writing staff believed in that concept so much that they didn't need to do here's Shredder and Bebop and Rocksteady, you know, until post credits happen. They just had the menagerie of other mutants. And, you know, but I thought that was fine. <laughs> it is fine. And I do like the other mutants. I don't want to shortchange them. It's just that, like, I don't know. Like, I feel like Rocksteady and Bebop are a little more special than that. Probably should have been a little more elevated. But that's that's OK. No, it, it is kind of weird that they weren't elevated. But it's, speaking of elevated, you, you managed to get fucking Giancarlo Esposito to play Baxter Stockman which might be the first time I've seen him be black in something. That's what I was going to ask you is, has Baxter Stockman ever been black before? Like, at, at, like in the comics, but I, I really think this is the first time I, I won't, I, I'm not going to come out and say it because Nick's done like a handful of extra series is, is now where that might've been the case, but this is the first time I've seen him be black and you're only going to have him on for five minutes. <laughs> yeah. He was, he was kind of out of there. I mean, it sets up the villain, <laughs> Um, Superfly, but yes, I, I, I am glad he was there, but yeah, he was, it was, it was short lived. I, I, I was kind of hoping he was going to come back as, you know, his fly self later because I, you know, you guys got him for this. Like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I have to say though, Ice Cube as Superfly, excellent. Jackie Chan as Splinter. Perfect. That was too super inspired casting choices that worked out so perfectly you know me i'm not usually the voice cast guy but those two excellent stuff and i'm not usually about uh, celebrity stunt casting either but it, it it was just a good time all the way down you had rose Byrne of all people for leatherhead and she's usually just on prestige tv i'm like you know what fine this is fine <laughs> <laughs> yeah um did you notice the pizza place is called the layered yeah, and I was trying to find more <laughs> more nods like that, like in the Mario movie where they're like, "Here's balloon fight mechanics," but I, I, I was I wasn't so savvy. <laughs> well, they went to Eastman High. They did go to Eastman High, so you know that that was also a thing. You know, they had to get that in there. I'm glad they did that. Um, I don't know how those guys feel about how the turtles have gone on through history. I'd, I've never really like researched that, but. I hope they're happy with what has happened with their creation because I would be. I think they. I feel like they just licensed it out to everybody until Nick bought it outright. No, 
Yeah, but I just wonder if they feel like they're I mean, I don't think they have any creative control over this stuff. I just wonder if they, you know, feel good about where it's gone. I cuz I would. Um I got to mention the music of course cuz I me, the Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross score, if you will, so fucking good. I'm a big 9 inch nails guy as it is, so I love when these guys get together and do soundtracks, whether it's a social network or, you know, whatever they've done. Um, to do a Turtles movie is something I wouldn't necessarily expect them to do. But man, great stuff. I mean, you again, I I always like push you to talk about music here, but you've got to at least you got to admit that much. It, it fit the movie. <laughs> That's all you're going to give me. I, I mean, it's 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 no uh, vanilla ice suddenly having a full turtle wrap ready for when the turtles fall through the ceiling. But, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. It's way better than that shit, because this uh, mutant mayhem had real 90s hip hop and R&B. That was the vibe. <laughs> I mean, come on. They did it for us, right? They did that shit for us. There was no need need to play like fucking like Black Street and like, you know, all all the songs they played in this. They did that for old people like us. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But it but it fit. And this is an example of like unlike the Mario movie where I felt like the licensed music didn't fit. I felt like it really fit in Ninja Turtles. Yes, that is basically what I really meant to say, because. With the Mario movie, I was sitting there going, okay, you, you know, <laughs> we, we we don't need this right now. And only to have my uh, fears confirmed a week later, like, hey, guys, look, look at all this great stuff on the soundtrack that we that wasn't in the movie. <laughs> no, uh, well, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross soundtracks are excellent anyway. But like, but yeah, um, I like that they played Anti Up like twice they played it when they were going sneaking into the the oh, corner yeah, store did. there yeah um hey you know there's a song we play every couple of weeks called the big deal and it intros our, our shows you know i mean i may have heard anti up a couple times growing up and thinking like hey you know maybe that's a nice sound if i ever did a podcast maybe uh you know i'm just just saying just thinking out loud i'm just ideas right now can you uh, legally admit to that out loud on the air? I did. It's fine. No one's listening. It's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's legally distinct enough where it doesn't. It's fine. Okay. Um, I, I like that the turtles, and this was a problem with the old cartoon, and is no longer the problem. I like that each turtle has a distinct like profile. In fact, that you can tell who they are without their masks on. You know. Like yes. Raph was kind of thick, right? And then like Leonardo's kind of like skinny. Even when they were the baby turtles, which by the way were cute as hell, Raph was just <laughs> a square little like turtle, this Box. fat little yeah, yeah. Excellent stuff. They actually tried that with the last Ninja Turtle series by making them four different species of turtle. And it's said that that series ended much sooner than it was supposed to. It ended up it had a poor initial reception, but then people saw it in action, like, oh, this isn't so bad actually, but it was too late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um you got anything else i think that's uh, this was a great movie i mean i don't want to say anything about the story or any of the action sequences or stuff like that. i don't want to ruin it I, w- I would rather people actually just see this but um yeah if you got anything else go for it just real quick it's not as criticism i've heard as much as the black april one and seriously fuck you if you're on the anti-black april team <laughs> Nobody, nobody listening to the show feels that way. I, I know, but I, I need to say fuck you if you're on the anti-Black April team. <laughs> yeah, Black but, April O'Neil was excellent. Yeah, she was. But we've had several iterations of the Turtles at this point, and I think it's fine that we have Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that live right now, even if uh, so much of New York City is gentrified right now. And I'm just a little bit curious if, if that's going to come into play in the... Uh, upcoming paramount series yeah we'll but see that's another, because this is supposed to be a tie-in to that we'll, we'll, we'll see yeah we'll see how that works out um there was um bef- before we uh wrap up here there was some a lot of genuinely funny lines there is some stuff that really made me laugh out loud i love when they busted in to get uh april scooter back and those those guys were like uh you know in the garage and I forget who's I think Donato's like there he's Tokyo drifting around <laughs> us. <laughs> Why did you say Tokyo drift? 
<laughs> oh man, I I think I think I think that's just to imply the kids think Tokyo Drift invented drifting. <laughs> <laughs> that was another thing, right? Like I loved how like teenagers they were like current teenagers and it didn't feel corny or like stupid or anything it felt very 2023 like i loved that it was it was a really great tone that they struck they yeah they really did and e- even if uh jackie chan splinter wanted them all to stay home no no it's bad outside but you know we'll we'll, we'll have a pizza party here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll let you we'll let you kids see that <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's really great stuff um anything to wrap up here you want to mention about anything turtles y before we go so real quick before we go thq embracer whoever the fuck's running this shit right now they announced a game for the last ronin it's a graphic novel about a more mature Ninja Turtle story. I haven't read it. I know me and you, Andre, we've discussed, uh, you know, how it'd be nice to see a more mature turtle storyline sometime. But do we have any faith in this sort of thing working out? <laughs> I think it could be good. I, it makes me worried just to see the Nickelodeon logo plastered up front first, because I don't think they're going to let them like do anything too wild basically what i've always wanted is something akin to the original comics which were a lot grittier and a lot you know kind of violent sometimes and you know not as comics tended to be at that time based off of you know weird amphibians who could talk you know and then it got i don't want to say sanitized when it became a kid's tv show but kind of right which is fine you know there's nothing wrong with that it's a good interpretation. I would just like to see someone do like the original comic material, like kind of exactly. I just think that would be an interesting take. Now, obviously, Last Ronin isn't going to be that, but it will be a take that I'm interested in. So tertiarily, yes, I'm kind of interested in Last Ronin. Do I think it'll be good? I don't know. Well, it doesn't have a, even a release window yet, just a teaser trailer online. So uh I don't know. Another year or two, you can we can come on with our opinion on on the show, and we'll be like, "This game fucking sucks." I don't know what we were even thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, probably. Um, do you, hey, do you remember the late '90s, like the live action turtles? It was called the Next Mutation. Do you remember that shit? I've heard of it, but I've never actually seen it. I seen a couple episodes of this back in the day. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and I just turned it off. I just saw the costumes. and I'm like, you know what? I, I can't. No, thank because you. Because that sounds that, that always sounded like a bad idea because I, I did some brief looking around right before uh, we recorded here. There's a dramatic difference in the costumes in between the first two movies and the third one. Yeah. There is because the first one kind of looks exactly like the comics. That's like the closest we ever got to that look. So I, I could only imagine it, it just got worse. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't very good. They looked like the ones from the concert I mentioned earlier. <laughs> they look they kind of looked like that. That dude, that that just sounds sad. <laughs> <laughs> well, the show had no budget and you could tell they were trying to do the like power ranger saying where you have like these kind of goofy costumes and like it's okay because that's the camp is kind of the charm but it just did not work anyway i think that's about it we i i feel kind of turtles out what do you say steve well i think i'm gonna order me a pizza and uh watch some tv i sure hope no one steals the statue of liberty this is april o'neill reporting <gasps> look behind you okay all right we're out of here See you next time. Follow us on Twitter at Fine Time Podcast. Bye, guys. We'll see you next time on, on, on Fine Time. <laughs>